Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Path to Self-Sovereignty podcast. Today, we are with Michael Feely. Michael, thanks a lot for coming on. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your history to get where you are today? Yeah, of course. Uh, I was born in the West Midlands in the UK, which is where I stopped predominantly for the, for the most part of my life, uh, just moving around a, a very, very small geographic area. I always had a passion as a, as a teenager to join the police force. It took me a long time to get in because at that time it was an extremely difficult, a difficult occupation to actually get in. They wanted lots of they wanted people with lots of life experience and different things. So it took me about seven or eight years to actually get into that career. But when I did, uh, I worked in, in London and Birmingham, which are England's two major cities. So I, always, I was always the front line in, in, in major cities and sort of inner city areas as well. And I did that for 17 years. I was also on the front line, so I was, I was going to uh, emergency calls. I was often the first at the scene of, of serious crimes, uh, hostage situations, murders, firearms incidents, or it could be something very, very mundane, like, you know, my neighbor keeps throwing cigarette butts over, over the guardian fence. <laughs> so it, 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 went, it literally went from one extreme polarity to the other sometimes. But as a result of that, I learned how to investigate. I learned how to spot evidence. I learned how to gather evidence and speak in a succinct manner because that evidence was always going to be presented in a court of law. In a court of law, all they are really interested in is just get to the point. What did you see? What did you smell? What did they say? What was the, what was the vision like? Was there any blockages? Was there any obstructions? What did you see? Tell us in 10 seconds what you saw. So really my, my speaking engagements, my writing is really based on evidential fact. And I was considered an expert eyewitness in, in the UK. Having spoken in before, you know, senior judges, some of the best barristers in the country who have grilled me for days and days in the witness box. It sort of teaches you to speak succinctly. So, which, which is what I do. Now, I, I expected to be in that career for for life. That was going to be in, in literally in seven or eight years' time from now, I would have been retired, and that would have been the end of my my working life. Seventeen years in, which I considered my first marriage, and you know, no, no one ever gets married to intentionally get divorced. But I consider the the, the place my first marriage, and seventeen years in, lots and lots of things began to happen to me that really turned my view of reality on top of its head. And as a result of some of the things that I was seeing and some of the things that I was experiencing, in addition to quite a lot of despondency with, with uh, the, the, the way in which the public service was going, how I was unable to serve the public and do what I joined to do because of politics, because of forced policy, which again was politics, which was really taking us away from, from the true origin of, of what the police force was there for. And again, that is, that is the same with any, any public service, I think, certainly in, in the UK, probably around the world. But it was taking me further and further away from what I joined for. And that was really causing a lot of internal battles, a lot of problems for me, sort of emotionally, energetically, whichever level you wish to, to take it, it was causing issues for me in my private life as well. And, and turning my personality into something that I didn't recognize myself. So with this and with, with all these paranormal things that were going on, and I couldn't actually go either a day or night without something would be happening. And it really turned my, my life on its head. And as a result, in 2009, I walked to the post office with my letter of, re of resignation. I handed it over the counter. They put a first class stamp on and I sent it. And I literally walked away with no emotion whatsoever. Wow. So it, it literally ended as simple as that. Now, for some, say for some, somebody who was absolutely dedicated, who had won awards for bravery, uh, my my bedroom at the, my old house, my mum's my house, the bedroom wall is full of awards and accolades. Now, for somebody to just go to the post office and hand a resignation in, and walk away with no issue, with no emotion, mm. it really tells you what was happening at that time in my life because it really was an important career. It was my my lifelong career. And it was my first marriage. And, and some of these paranormal things were literally seeing UFOs in the sky day and night. 
receiving messages, uh, seeing literally dimensional doorways, gateways, wormholes, whatever you call them, or want to call them, opening up in the night sky and seeing craft coming out of them. And that craft would then literally fly across the sky and the wormhole will just dissipate. There's lots and lots of these things that were going on. You know, I'd, I'd go into for a walk in forestry and I'd have what people deem as shadow people walking past. That there's all of these things that were going on in, in my life at that time. Uh, sort of consciously, I experienced time travel, but not physically, consciously. And a lot of the things that happened to me in 2009, in the present day, I'm now looking into from a scientific perspective and I'm able to prove scientifically what happened to me 11 years ago. So it's sort of now, this is what happened, what happened, well, this is what happened and scientifically I can prove it happened and what was the reason for that happening and I now have all of these answers. The, the reason for these things happening is because I had to first of all learn and experience in order to be able to sit here and speak about them. Now, the way I, I typified that was you cannot speak about wine without knowledge of the grape. So in other words, if you're going to sit here and, and, sit and, and claim to be some kind of authority, then you at least need to have, have seen and experienced what you're talking about. Because even when I've done uh, conferences in the past, and most of my conferences are just sort of multi-subject, multi, multi -subject, but some of them have been specific subjects like ufology or, mm. or or things like that now when i've done ufology i also bring lots of other things into it to expand on it but when i the, the first ufo conference that i did a couple of years ago even the host of that conference said a lot of the people who are on that stage talking about the ufos now have never seen one mm -hmm. now obviously what he was getting at is if, if you're going to stand on that stage and talk about them it helps if, if you've seen them and experienced them. Yeah, yeah, now, now, it gives you a little bit more credibility to have experienced firsthand what you're talking about. And the reason that I, I saw so much, and literally on a daily, on a, on a nightly basis, was so I can sit here or stand on the stage and talk about what I've seen mm -hmm. and explain to people some of the reasoning behind what has happened to me. Let's put a little bit of context beyond the the sightings, for example, because there's a lot of people out there who've been listening to this who think you're barking mad. Yes. Can you explain one of these, just one or two of these happenings, what actually occurred? Yeah, okay. Well, again, there's so many I could choose from, but let's say, okay, Saturday afternoon, bright Saturday afternoon in my hometown, in the car with the wife, going around islands, just driving, and... We both saw it, we both looked up. In the corner of our eye, there was something in the sky. And when we looked up, there was three gigantic UFOs, uh, cigar-shaped UFOs in the sky, forming a triangle in different parts of the sky. They were probably about five, 600 feet in the air, static in a triangle, just motionless in the sky. Mm. Now, you would expect it to be like a scene from Independence Day where everyone's dumping the cars and they're out <laughs> in the doors and they're looking up and think, there's no reaction from, uh, as far as we could see, there's no reaction from anyone other than we could see them. Now, this, this, is, this was one of many. So I've either seen them with the wife by myself or with groups of friends when I've, when I've seen things. So it's not just my mental issues. It's, it's people who <laughs> with me who either have the same mental issues or they're seeing what I'm seeing. <laughs> so, and, and this, we, we saw this in the sky. You know, we, we've, we've been... We went on holiday in Rome and saw things in the sky. I've been to Jersey in the Channel Islands and seen things in the sky. I've seen things in Birmingham, seen things in different parts of the country. I even did a talk in February this year in San Francisco where I was taking one of the days when I was there, I was in the hotel room, literally just got my, my, my phone and I thought I'm just going to take some pictures of the landscape as, as a memory. And I just went... Ch -ch 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 across the landscape in San Francisco. Now, literally four weeks ago, uh, which is a couple of months after the, after the conference, I was looking through, through the photographs and with a view to deleting them because my phone now is full. I can't take any pictures or because my memory's full. So it was with a view to deleting them. And I deleted a few, but then I looked at this one and something just caught my eye. Just caught my eye on the photograph. It's just little, some, a wide speck. 
and one actually blew the photograph up. It's actually a UFO, a disc-shaped UFO. Mm. So it was, it was invisible to the eye. That is simply because, again, scientifically, what we see is a reflection or refraction of light. Now, if something moves faster than your eye and brain can actually decipher the light that's coming off it, it appears invisible. We can't see it. Now, this must have been flying at some, some velocity, some speed that I was not able to see it with, with my own eye. Mm. It wasn't the only thing in the, in, in the photograph that was moving. Because obviously it was above a highway, a freeway, or whatever the Americans wish to call it. And there were, there were cars driving quite fast down the freeway. This, this UFO was probably the size of one of their, one of their cars. Because, again, looking at the size between the highway and the vehicles on the highway, and this thing that was probably about 250 feet above them. So everywhere I seem to go, something seems to happen. And, uh, and yes, people do will turn around who've never seen anything or don't believe this, and will think that is mad. But let's put it into some perspective. Everything that we can see as humans, that is, we can see, we can sense, we can touch, we can smell, we can experience, that we believe is our reality, is less than 1% of the frequency spectrum. What is in the 99 plus percent that we cannot see? Because this is where all the things that I have seen are and where they are sort of concealing. It's a, it's a, when you look into Einstein and Nikola Tesla and all the great scientists, they will tell you that the universe is a frequency. Now, if you tune into different frequencies, you will see different parts and different aspects of the universe. Because we are contained, for the want of a better phrase, within a third dimensional frequency as human beings. That is typically what we see, what is within. So we, we have five senses. We experience seven colours or a combination of the seven colours. And the speed of light is a speed limit for the physical body. So that really is the limitations of this third dimensional reality. If we were to go beyond the speed of light, then our leptons and our quarks inside our body, which are the subatomic particles that bind us together, cannot bind together beyond the speed of light. They would separate and therefore there would be no structured matter. So our particles would not be in this apparent solid form. They are not in a solid form, but because they have joined together, it gives the appearance of solidity. So that is the speed of light. We cannot go beyond the speed of light as a physical being. We see the five senses as a physical being. And as I say, we are controlled by the seven colors or the combination. That is really the third dimensional spectrum. Yeah. There's lots of things beyond the third dimensional spectrum that is all around us in the quantum field, in the quantum data. Some people call the Akashic records. It's, it's the universal information that is forever around us. And because we are part of that universal quantum field, because it is subatomic particles, particles, photons, electrons, protons, everything is, is the makeup of our body. So we are part of that quantum field, but we are condensed at the moment into a third dimensional frequency. When you look outside that third dimensional frequency, then you open yourself up to a lot of these phenomena that I've witnessed. And I'm not the only person who was witnessing these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fair point. I also think it's very, very ignorant for people to, to, to think that we are the only species uh, out there. I think it's so uh, self-centred and ignorant that it's just mind-blowing to me. Well, put it this way, we're not the only species on, on our own planet. Yeah. Now, every month, for example, in, in the forests of Borneo, every month, scientists find a new species that they've never come across previously. This is every month, and this is our own planet. We don't, we don't understand our oceans. We don't understand our planet. We don't understand the way that the body works, how the planet works, what's underneath the sea. We don't know what's, what's above us in the universe. So how can we turn around and say that we are the only species to exist? Mm. It's absolute nonsense. And for, 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 for any scientist that comes around and, and truly believes, it's not just you know the brian cox on bbc who's sort of <laughs> reading who's reading the mainstream script for any scientist that really truly believes that we are the only living thing in the universe really should not be a scientist because it is absolute nonsense to suggest that human beings are the only species in this universe the universe is teeming with life different forms of life 
and some of it is humanoid, some of it is bacteria, some of it is, is little things in water. It, it's, it's different forms of life. But quite clearly, when you look at the universal makeup, when you look at how basically the, the code of the universe is mathematics and sacred geometry and everything adheres to numerical patterns, that can only lead to one conclusion when you're looking too deeply like I have, that that is a designer, that is a super intelligent designer. Now, when you take that super intelligent design of mathematics, and when I'm asleep, I get lots and lots of mathematical sequences that I have to work out because they are messages. It makes sense that if the if what people call the creative force is a mathematician, which it must be, because the design of the universe is mathematics, the design of humanity is mathematics, the design of every single thing in this universe is mathematics. So therefore it must be a mathematician that has put this together. It also makes sense that when people are seeing new medical sequences, and there's quite a few people that get in touch with me saying I keep seeing triple one or triple five, what, what, does, what does it mean? Now I always say, if you go on holiday this year to Japan, don't be surprised if someone speaks Japanese. In other words, if the language of the universe is mathematics, don't be surprised when you see mathematical sequences as a message, because that is the language in the reality that we exist, in the universe that we exist. So there's all of these, these things. Now, when you start going into the ancient monuments as well, which I do, the likes of the Great Pyramid, the Sphinx, Stonehenge, Obelisks, you, obelisks, you will see that all of these major sites were not individual constructions. They were all a joint enterprise now they are a joint enterprise because within the longitude and latitude coordinates of these monuments they are giving their precise location mathematically of their location on earth not only are they giving their own location but they're given the location of other monuments so the great pyramid tells you where stonehenge is stonehenge tells you where the great pyramid is and going in, in an extension of that the famous face on mars tells you how to find stonehenge on earth Stonehenge on Earth tells you how to find the Sidonian city on Mars. The Great Pyramid also tells you and vice versa. So what you have is you have a mathematical system that is a satellite navigation system through mathematics, through numbers. So how does that map? So for example, how does the pyramid tell us where Stonehenge is? By its diameters, by its grid vectors. So when, when you start looking at fragments say the Sphinx is at 5,400 on a grid vector mm. that gives you the, the, the diameter and location of Stonehenge. So it's basically three mathematical numbers. Oh. Now, when I get into my car and I, I, I've been somewhere that I've never been before, what I do is I get the sat down and I type in the postcode and it takes me to that location. What they were doing in the ancient past, we're doing it through mathematics, through mathematical sequences. And, you know, the likes of the, the face on Mars is exactly a, a mile long why is it a mile long because a mile is a nautical measurement it's a navigation system and they were they were they were finding each other through mathematics mm. now this has been worked out by mathematicians you know uh, it's been worked out by the likes of richard c hoagland who actually mapped out geometrically the side down in city on mars and i was on his show uh, a month or so ago and we had a quite a good conversation about the 19.5 degree effects which is really uh, the energy belt of Earth, which upon all these super pyramids are built, because it really is a, an energy center of Earth that, that allows them to transmit beyond beyond the Earth and throughout the Earth. Yeah. So the, there's all of these these proofs, if people wish to look into them, that when I first started looking into all these ancient monuments and ancient cultures, I looked at them as in individual entities. But then I soon realized that now it's all part of our matrix, it's all part of this energy center that is all working together mm. the only thing that's the difference is the shape of the monuments but they are all really multi-dimensional oscillators which are resonance machines so who built them would, it be, would you say that they're ets for the lack of a better word or would you say that they're human beings or a mixture of the two my opinion is it's not humans who built them it is certain humans of certain civilizations who were taught how to use them. Okay. Now, when you start looking at the Egyptians who documented everything they did, there is no documentation of them building the, the, the pyramids. Now, when you, if, for anyone who's ever been to the pyramids, mm. you know, they are, until the Eiffel Tower was built, the Great Pyramid was the, was the biggest structure on earth. So 
these things are magnificent. Now, now, what are they? They are basically consciousness machines. They are portals. They create portals through sound and built them. My theory is either it was the creative mind itself or it was multidimensional intelligences that were acting on behalf of the creative force. Now, the reason I say that is because there is a plan and humanity, through its ignorance, has fallen off that plan. Humanity needs to be brought back to its correct time zone. We are probably, in knowledge and spirituality, we're probably 2,000 or, or plus years behind where we should be. Right. So we are now being helped by mathematical breadcrumbs to basically get back to our original timeline, which is, which is in advance, far in advance than where we are now where we don't believe that we're the only species in the world and then where we, yeah. we, we understand about ourselves, and we understand about our race, we understand about our position in the galactic scheme of things. Mm. So these things for me are the breadcrumbs of assistance. Now, it's, it's far too deep a subject to sort of go into it in a, mm. in a show. It's far too deep a subject to go into it in a free hour live talk. It is such a deep subject where everything really correlates with everything else. And when you understand the creative mind, when you understand the blueprint of the universe, you understand that that blueprint is written within stone. So it's really the, the fingerprint of the universal language in stone. And that is why archaeologists are not going to find the answers digging in the ground because that's not where it is. Yeah, yeah. The, the answers are in the stone, the, the multidimensional oscillators. Now, the, 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 the current thing I'm writing at the moment called the serious point goes into starlight star frequencies and now when they align at certain times then it opens up basically stargates now some some proof of that kind of thing is in 1971 in august 1971 a police a police officer and a farmer witnessed the disappearance of five men inside the inner circle of stonehenge and that was accompanied by blue flashes of light screams and the five people who were there disappeared yet their campfire was still there and their tents were still there, but the five people just disappeared and never have been seen since. At certain times, just like with the Bermuda Triangle, there is gateways, dimensional gateways that are happening. Now, when we go- So what is a stargate for people who don't know? A stargate is basically a portal. So when, when, you, when you see certain stars and, and the, the Lion Gate is one of them, uh, hence the reason we have the Sphinx and we have certain alignments within Egypt and the Giza Plateau and the Sirius Point which takes you to Abu Rawash we, we have at certain points at certain times stargates that open now our Earth which is obviously uh, allowed to live and, and life is allowed to live by the Sun now our Sun, our solar Sun is in a binary with Sirius A so we have the solar sun and we have the great central sun which is Sirius now they are in the binary now I think that our solar sun is actually the Sirius C that the Dalgan tribe of West Africa thousands of years ago was speaking about because you have Sirius A which we can see Sirius B which we can't see Nephthys the invisible sister and we have Sirius C in my opinion which is the solar sun now Sirius A and the solar sun are in a binary now because of what is known as the Doppler effect which is basically the frequency of light and color of stars. When Sirius is going away from Earth, it gives off a red color. When it's coming back to Earth, it gives off a blue color. Mm. Now, this is the Hopi Indian Kachina red and blue star prophecy. Because when Sirius comes back in, it engulfs the Earth with this, this consciousness of light. And that is why in masonry, actually, when you see a bright sun, it's really serious. It is the blazing star. Blazing, serious, means scorching. So when you see and you think all these Masonic emblems have the solar sun, it's actually serious. Right, okay. Now, when you start taking Sirius back to Egypt, this is Isis, the goddess Isis, which is really the, the, the cosmic womb, the creation of everything. And it is believed that our sun came from Sirius. Now, when you start looking at the human body, you will see that DNA is actually programmed elsewhere. It is not programmed on Earth. And the physical body is from the Orion Nebula. And that is why Orion 
Osiris is so important in the ancient world because it's also a stargate. You have in the skies in the ecliptic, you have the silver gate, which is marked by Orion, and you have the golden gate, which is basically the gate of the gods. Now, the silver gate is the gate of man, where the soul comes in and out of this reality, according to these ancient beliefs. So, which so, is serious? Which is serious? Orion, Orion is the silver gate. Yeah. Which is the, the gate of man, where yeah. the soul comes in and goes out, which is the Egyptian duet, yeah. which is basically the, the world, the, the underworld, the, the, okay. the region of the underworld. Mm. And we have the golden gate, which is really by Ophidukus, which is, which is the serpent. Now, the guardian of these gates is Sirius A. So when we have all of these alignments of the, of the, the Great Pyramid, and we have Abu Rawash, which is the Lost Pyramid, what I call the Sirius point, then when all these are in alignment, you are creating stargates because it is the alignment of these planets. Now, this is what the Egyptians believe. This is what certainly within the ancient spirituality is what they believe. So we have all of these different things that are going on that we don't know about. And it's going on all above us. It's going on all around us. Yeah, yeah. When you start looking, you know, the, the, the likes of the Sphinx, now people are arguing, and scholars and Egyptologists are arguing, that the head of the Sphinx must have been changed because it's too small for his body. It is not. It is correct. Now, when you start looking at the things that I've looked at and you start looking at Leo, you start looking at the lion below and the lion above, as above, so below. So you have the Sphinx and you have the constellation of Leo, the lion. When you look at the, the constellation of Leo, the lion, you will see that his head is smaller than his body. So all the Sphinx is doing is representing his cosmic cousin his cousin yeah, brother yeah, yeah. so you know before i went to egypt in 2010 I, I received a cryptic very very cryptic message from a psychic medium that i'd never met i, I didn't know she just emailed me at the blue and said regarding your trip to egypt basically you, you were gonna add lots and lots of sacred knowledge to your toolbox and she said get to, to the closest part to the right hand side of the sphinx as you possibly can because within that is an ancient knowledge now when you look at how Leo appears to the Sphinx, it is side on. Now the solar sun comes into Leo, it is side on. That solar sun appears on the right hand side of Leo, which is why I was told to go to the right hand side of the Sphinx. There is something there that has been added to my toolbox of sacred knowledge. Right. When, when you start getting all these synchronicities and then people tell you something and then people who, who don't know what you've already been told tell you something else that correlates and then somebody else does and somebody else does. Mm. When the same numbers, when the same words, when the same symbols, when the same synchronicities keep coming up time and time again individually, then it's time to take note. Mm. Mm. And there's, there's just so much of this world that we don't understand. Oh, now, gosh, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, you mentioned there about uh, Orion being the silver gate, which is the gate of man. See, my understanding, which is slightly different to that, is that Isis was the moon and that was sort of the where the souls come in and out, as it were, yeah. until you get to a point of illumination where you can sort of transcend past that point. I think, I got. I mean, to be fair, I got that from Helena Blavatsky, um, the secret yeah. doctrine. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Now, what, what happens, Sirius A is associated with Isis, but the moon is also seen as the personification of Isis. Like the exoteric. <clears throat> it, it is, it's, it's sort of a an appearance so, so they are both connected right, with okay. the same because they are both basically the feminine the feminine principle so we have Sirius A which is Isis but Isis is also associated with the moon so so that is that is correct now the, the moon is, is important because basically moon means measure now the ancients measured a lot of things based on the movement of the moon. In Islam, you have the lunar calendar. Yeah. You know, we have all of these ancient lunar calendars which are important to the feminine principle. When you start looking at the Holy Communion and, and the drinking of, of, of the blood of Christ, it's really the Soma of the mystics, which is really the drink yeah. of the initiates, which is the, the menstrual blood of the female. Right. Their menstrual blood contains lunar energy which is the feminine principle that then takes you into the Mary Magdalene and the womb, the Holy Grail, which relates to geometry, which relates to the Vesica Pisces. Inside the Vesica Pisces, if you draw two interlinked circles in the middle, you'll see what's called the Mandola, which is means almond. That is the Yoni, but it's also uh, male genitalia as well. 
it is the Christ and the Magdalene as union in one. Now, the Yoni, the Magdalene, is really the, the feminine cup, the, the, the womb. Mm. So we, we have all of these things which is influenced by these planetary yeah. things as well. It's symbolic, isn't it? Uh, it goes back ancient, obviously, but why does religion cover this up? Because the average religious person, in fact, I'd say most, 99% plus, would have absolutely no idea what's being said here. So don't. And, and what, it's what, covered up for a reason? Is it, is it, yeah. or is it just because of their own ignorance? They don't know. The priest class. It, it's, it's covered up. Basically, confusio lingarium, which basically means confusion by tongues. That, is, that then leads us to the Tower of Babel, which is confusion. What has happened is that the likes of the Levites created Christianity. Now, the Levites go all the way back, obviously, to, to Hebrew, to Israel, the, the former Israel, the former Can Canaanites, yeah. who, were, who were at odds with the Egyptian dynasties. Now, the Levites, Levites, Leviathan, means serpent. So the Christianity was created by the serpent priests. Now, what I mean by serpent priests is the serpent is seen as a as wisdom, but also as a phallic symbol. Now, when you look at the Bible, when you look at who really Christ really is, even when you look at the Great Pyramid of Egypt, it's talking about transmutation through sexual alchemy, which is really sexual continence or sexual uh, sublimation, which is what we know as celibacy. Now, what they what they realise is by certain rituals. Instead of that, that sacred energy thrusting outwards, if they retained it and thrust it inwards, it would create the awakening of the, the dragon of earth, which is the Kundalini awakening, yeah. which Kundalini. That is the earth dragon energy, but that is inside our spine. Now, when that is activated, it rises up Jacob's ladder, which is the spine, yeah. and it transmutes. That is why we see the Egyptians with, with serpents on their head, because the Ardra and Pingala nerves, when they meet at the, the third eye, it creates a transmutation. So when you start looking at the origins of Christianity, when you look at the likes of Jehovah's Witnesses, when you look at the likes of Yahweh, they are all serpent gods. When you look at Quetzalcoatl, when you look at Kulkakan, who is another name for Quetzalcoatl, it's all talking about this dragon energy of Earth, which is the Kundalini. They're all talking about the transmutation of self through certain rituals and certain practices. Now, when you look at Yahweh, Yahweh is really a serpent god. Now, Jehovah is the Latin equivalent of the Hebrew Yahweh. Yes, yes, yes. So when you have Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on your door, their religion comes from the serpent priesthoods, the Aphite priesthoods, which is really the worship of the serpent. And that is why the serpent is, is depicted a billion Everywhere. times in the ancient yeah. past. That is why the serpent is, is, is in the Bible, because those who wrote the Bible, like the Levites, Levi, serpent, have written all this secret knowledge. Now, there are three levels of teachings. There's the outer level, which is your preached public levels of religion, all religion. Yeah. You have the inner levels, which is where people have more of an in-depth knowledge as to what's really going on. But then you have the secret level. The secret level is what I'm talking about because people are not meant to know this. People are not. Pe people have been given a fictional story to keep them away from the true destiny, which is themselves. So all of these little hints keep getting dropped. You know, the kingdom of God is within you. You know, the the, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but not to them. What what do you think that means? Mm. There are multi tiers of knowledge. Now these these priesthoods, we need to keep it within their own clan within their own sections of, of society. And they didn't want people, the masses, the vulgar, the unsophisticated, to know the knowledge that they knew. So what did they do? They encoded it within metaphors because only those who are taught how to read those metaphors and understand and interpret them correctly will get the secret teachings. Yeah, they're like keys, aren't they? They are like keys, and that's exactly because the Great Pyramid is the key to this transformation. It is all to do with the Great Pyramid, or a lot of it's to do with the Great Pyramid. They are keys. Now, when you start seeing uh, symbolic, the golden key, the golden key is symbolic of worthiness of receiving sacred knowledge. In 2009, I received the golden key in my mind's eye, and I kept seeing a golden key. Right. 
And as, 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 physically, ago. you could see the golden, the golden. I could see it in my my eye. It, it, it wasn't a physical manifestation. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was a golden key that I kept seeing in my mind's eye. I didn't know what a golden key was at that particular time, but I do now. So the, these ancient priests, these ancient pharaohs, these ancient higher priests, even when you get to you know the, the highest degree of masonry today, which really comes from the Levite, so does the Knights Templar, so does the Rosicrucians, so does the Druids. All of these things come from the, the, the central origin, which is like the Pharisees and the Levites, who are the oral teachings of this sacred knowledge. You know, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, he received the law. Receiving Hebrew is Kibel. Kibel gives us the word Kibala. Kibala, yeah. The Kibals. So it, again, there's there's all of these little snippets of of information that are that are telling us these things. So the the the, the ancient priests, the ancient high priests, the thirty three degree and above of masonry, the the highest druids, all of these people hold on to this secret knowledge, and this secret knowledge is kept away from the world. It is kept away from the world by parables, by symbology, by metaphors, and by codes. Do you, think it's, do you think it's the right thing that it's kept from the profane? <clears throat> I personally know, and that is the reason that I spend a lot of my time telling people about these secrets, because my opinion is when people understand this knowledge, it lifts them. At the moment, we have, we have a, a reality that is, that is given to us. We have a reality that says... Allah is this, Muhammad is this, Christ is this, Jehovah is this, Yahweh is this. People are told what to believe and what to think. When people start to think for themselves, now thinking is, is reason. Reason is the highest form of mind. Now when people start to think and reason, they are entering the higher mind, which is really what one of these ancient secrets. Now when you start looking at the likes symbology of the start of Bethlehem, and many people in the UFO community tell me that this was the first recorded UFO. It's not. The start of Beth, the start of Bethlehem is the pentagram. The pentagram is a symbol of the ancient mysteries going all the way back to Pythagoras and earlier. Mm. Because the pentagram is the saviour of the world. The five wounds of Christ is the pentagram. It is the saviour of the world. So when you start looking at the start of Bethlehem, it leads wise men to their inner Christos, to their inner Christ. It leads wise men to Christ himself. It is the pentagram. Why couldn't King Herod see the star of Bethlehem? Because he represents the masses who lack the knowledge and the wisdom to see the ancient mysteries. Yeah, as, as apparently Jesus said, if you, if you go down that route, seek and you shall find uh, nothing. It will be opened unto you. I, do, exactly. I look at the world now and I don't think people want to know. I think they crave leadership from external things. So, so from my perspective, I'm yep. going... I don't know whether it's a good idea to share these things for, for, for me, because I, is it going to push people further away? Or, or um, because they yeah. need that, they need the Donald Trumps and the whoever else in order to, to satisfy something within themselves. That is correct, but, but don't they deserve the choice? They do, most definitely they do, but you yeah. found it, yeah. and I found it, well, I found a different way of looking at the world. So if you and I have being able to do it and there's millions across the globe now waking up to a lot of this stuff um is it is it now just not ignorance in many cases it is i mean so i can't remember who coined the phrase but some somebody said that we risk we, we run the risk of being the most informed society that dies of ignorance yeah it's a great quote that yeah i can't remember who said it but but basically that is spot on yeah because people now have the chance and the mechanisms, you know, they, they don't have to go to the library anymore and sit there. They don't have to go and visit their local priest and get and say 10 hell Marys and get forgiven. And because <laughs> sin, sin and hell are creations of the church to keep people in control. Yeah. They don't exist. Uh, sin basically means falling short, which is really the gold bullseye. So anybody who is sinful is basically lacking the knowledge. Hell is really your, alchemical condition of the body based on thoughts and actions that so if some mean. exactly so if somebody's forever anger and and full of vengeance then they will be in a state of hell because the sulfur the chemical within their body will be a state of hell for them and all of these things are, have been kept to keep people in but yes people have a choice people can for, for me i sit for hours 
and study and learn and piece these things together. But, but that is my personal choice. My personal choice is that I want to know. My personal choice is that I want to, I want to know why people knock on doors and why people say certain things and, and why, you know, why White said that Moses opened the Red Sea. It, it didn't, it's metaphorical. Mm. But I want to know these things. Now, other people don't, but that is their choice. But 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 they have a choice because at the moment all all they're giving is what the priests say, or what or what the the Sufis say, or, or their priests and their and their bishops. The, the the only reality they get is what they are being told. Now my opinion is they should they have a right to be able to make a choice, and if they choose that they don't want to know, that's on them. Carry on. Yeah yeah. But you know you are going to have that choice, and more and more people are choosing. To, to, to take that choice, to, to take that action. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Christianity, because obviously we live in a, a Judeo-Christian sort of society, as it were. Um, do you personally think that Jesus, the man, was a man? Or no. You... Okay, over to you. No. <laughs> no, when you look at the, the, the ancient principles, when you look at the ancient mysteries, when you look at documented quotes, from various popes. Pope Leo X said it has served as well the Smith of Christ. The current Pope, Pope Francis, in 2017, said Christ is metaphorical, not literal. When you start looking at the ancient mystery schools, now the story of Christ was used probably about 15 times before Christ came into history. So you have, you know, Dionysus, you have Semiramis, Nimrod, you have Horus, you have Isis. All of these traits of life, born on the 25th of December to a virgin, virgin birth, died, crucified. All of these, these characters, this story has been used several times before the story of Christ. So Christ is really the code for the Christos. The Christos is the, the, the secret fire within that is activated by the serpent, the Kundalini, which wraps itself around the spine, which is Satan at the tree of knowledge. So when you, when you look at these things, you will see that religion is really sexual alchemy. Christianity is sexual alchemy. Now, when you look at the, the origin of the word priest, the word priest comes from magush, which gives us magi. So the ancient priests were magicians, the magi, and they were alchemists. Now, the desire of the alchemist is to reach the philosopher's stone, the stone of wisdom, the knowledge stone, which is... King Arthur pulling Excalibur, Excalibur, Libera, uh, Libertarius, liberated from the stone. Only the certain few will extract the knowledge from the stone. That is the King Arthur story. When you look at their, their mindset, their belief system, and trace it all the way back, you will see that Christ is code for Christos, which is the secret fire within. Now, this, this, the, the life of Christ is really talking about the life of this Christos. You know, Nazareth is talking about the seed, Christ saviour means he who sows the seed so the saviour is sperm sperm which means seed now the 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 work of christ to be his father's work age 12 which is the age of puberty sexual activation in male children so when you start looking at the the, the way in which this sexual alchemy this sexual sublimation sexual continent celibacy works it thrusts this energy up the body through basically not relying on the spasm of the animal which is orgasm by allowing those energies to thrust upwards instead of outwards by energetic discharge when that comes all the way up into Golgotha a place of skulls you are activated your conscious is activated your consciousness that is your Christ and there are several different parts of the story that are relevant to that that are relayed in the Bible Bethlehem the house of bread what is bread Bread is the seed, the seed from which all grows, which is sperm. So we have Bethlehem, the house of bread, and we have sperm, of our seed. Nazareth, Nazareth, Naza, comes from seed. So Jesus of Nazareth is Jesus of the seed. When you start looking into the different characters, Joseph is Yesod, which is sexuality. When you start looking at Mary, it is Ra. Uh, Mio, which is basically talking about the waters of creation, which when they join together, the fire and the water, it activates the sleeping dragon. 
That is why you have the altar stone of Stonehenge on top of a yin aquifer, which is a natural water, because it is the fire and the water that creates the dragon, the sleeping dragon. It is all to do with the, the alchemy of sacred sex. It is all to do with certain rituals that awaken the Christos, the Christ within. So no, none of the biblical characters, the famous ones, Moses, Noah, Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Mary, Joseph, they are not real people. They are metaphors for what we can be, our potential. Right. So we are all potential Christ beings. And that is, that is really what they are telling us. But they've created these outer deities mm. because in, in the year 325 AD, Emperor Constantine of Rome decided what you or me or the masses were going were gonna to know and we're going to believe. And that's not here. And, and at least 45 books were removed or edited from the Bible. Mm. Now, one of those books is the Lost Gospel of St. Thomas. The Lost Gospel of St. Thomas tells you how to connect to the field. The field, some people will know that as the Bob Proctor Law of Attraction. That is the field. Now that, also, that also gets into the science of, of thermodynamics, where when you start imagining, when you start believing, when you start connecting to this field, that is the manifestation. That is science. That is what the Gospel of St. Thomas was telling you, how to connect to the field. How you to connect to the field is by the term that is in there, surround yourself. Surround yourself in the field is basically believing it's already here. Now, when somebody turns around and says, I want to win the lottery, I want to be a millionaire, the word want is pushing that from you. That it goes against the field because want is the future. What, what the last book of St. Thomas is telling you is that you must surround, you must believe that you already have it because that is now. Mm -hmm. Now, Constantine took all of these, these secret things out of the Bible because they, they didn't want people to connect. They didn't want people to connect to themselves because that is where God resides in the body. They wanted to, to create an outside deityism of yeah. icons because when people start looking outside of themselves, they will never find the kingdom of God because it's inside them. That is how they are able to exercise control by keeping people outside of where that sacred knowledge is, which is inside them. Yeah. And that is, that is why they've created this system of, of basically superficial stories that are keeping people from their destiny, from the true knowledge, which is within. So what's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of hiding it? Is it to keep mankind down? Yes. Right. Well, when, when, you, when you look at the, the way in which our, our reality is structured, we have, it's, it's like a pyramid, again, it's like a pyramid where everybody just knows their part of what they need to know. <clears throat> now, it's been likened as the, 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 one of the symbols of Egyptian royalty and also the Meriavingian bloodlines of France. Their symbol is of a bumblebee. Now, the reason it's a symbol of the bumblebee is the bumblebee lives in an ordered and structured society. You have the hive, which is basically run on a hive mind. That hive mind is controlled by the queen or the leader. We are the worker bees. Now, the worker bees are basically the hive mind, which is the reality of humanity. We all basically are told to believe the same things. So in one capacity or another, we are all believing really in the same thing by different names. So we are the hive mind, we are the worker bees. Now within the worker bees, you have the hierarchy, you know, the queens, the leaders, which are the leaders of this system. And the, the way reality is, is that the, the worker bees rely upon the instructions of that leader, of that queen. Within that society, you also have drone bees. Now drone bees are basically those who contribute nothing to the hive, they only basically encourage reproduction. So we have the queen and the leaders, we have the worker bees, and we have the drones who contribute nothing. Putting that into the system that we live in now, the leaders rule the hive mind, the workers, the workers, the mister, the missus, the miss, contribute 
by paying taxes, by working, we contribute something to the hive. The drones are those on universal credit or on, on state benefit, because in their mind, they contribute nothing to the hive. They basically just take. So the worker bees make the honey, which feeds the drones. So the drones just take, they contribute nothing. This is how they see the unemployed, the disabled, those who are not working, those who are on disability benefits, those who are on universal credit. They are the drone bees of this ordered society. Now, because the workers are being replaced by technology now in our society, there's less need for workers. The less need for workers is what you can get all the way down to a depopulation plan, which is not just me saying it, it has been recorded. Yeah, yeah, world, yeah. Le world leaders are saying it. Yeah. It's not just me saying it. It is depopulation because there are now less need for the workers because we are being replaced by technology. There's also less need for drones because they contribute nothing. So why do you think there's poisons in food? Why do you think we don't eat anything that, that really is food anymore? It's just food like yeah, it has vaccines. zero vibration. Yeah. Vaccines, uh, things in the air, mm. uh, chemtrails, which are really known as positive ions. Positive ions are clusters of negativity that make people ill. So we have all of these things. And again, it's, it's been documented. So the, we, have, we have all of these things where we have the, be, uh, the hive as an ordered society, but runs under a hive mind, a hive consciousness, which is everyone operates under the same beliefs, but they are controlled by those at the top, the, the, the leaders, the queen, the kings, whatever. So that really is the ordered society that we live in. Now, why are they going to upset the harmony of ignorance by telling people the truth? Because they're not going to, because this, this system suits them. If you are a control freak, you need someone to control. If you are a bully in the schoolyard, you need someone weak to go and pick on. That's just how these people work and, and how they operate. Mm. So you have a very, very small amount of people that control the hive. When people start, when, when people like me and you, the free thinkers, we disrupt the harmony of ignorance within the hive. So what do they do? They turn the hive against us. You're a conspiracy theorist. You wear a tin hat. You're bonkers. You're mad. You have mental health issues because we are being stung by the rest of the hive they're turning against us. Mm. So it's actually, as, as I've known this for years, it's actually a good sign if people think you're mental. You're doing something right. If, if <laughs> you know, if, if, if <clears throat> any luminous piece of paper that comes off a photocopying machine will get noticed because people are expecting a grey, dull Monotonous, tone yeah. just being repeated, 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 repeated from that photocopier. We live in a world that is a photocopier and people are the gray scale but when you start getting bright pinks and bright yellows coming off the machine all of a sudden we can't handle this what what's going on there must there must be some there must be a fault in the machine it's a glitch in the matrix and the more and more people that start to to free think and start looking at this we are disrupting the hive mind because the hive mind runs on believing what it's told yeah. Now, so when, when, start... when, when was this subtle <clears throat> shift, do you think? Because obviously, we, there's a, I, I know you've done some work on Atlantis and Lumeria and, and, and those ancient civilizations. Was it the beginning of monotheism that sort of created this shift in uh, the individual psychology? When, again, when you look at how the universe works, now we are, we are literally, when I talk about the universe, I'm not talking about something that is a different entity to do anything that's in it, because we are all part of that makeup. So I want to talk about the universe, I want to talk about everything within that universe includes us. Yeah. When you look at how the universe works, everything is timed. What is time? Time is the oscillation of the cesium atom, so time is atomic. Now, at the time of the Big Bang, time was created. Because before the Big Bang, before atoms, there was no time, only okay. infinity. Yeah. So when, when time was created through the cesium, uh, the oscillation of the cesium atom, which gives us the basis of the second, now the basis of the second gives us the concept of time. Time is also a way in which we measure distance and speed. So without time, we can't measure distance or speed. Now, when you look at how the universe works, everything in the universe is timed, whether a lifespan, whether this, that, and the other, everything is timed. For me, 
human consciousness is timed because I was saying moments ago, we are well behind our timeline where we should be in relation to progression of the mind, progression of spirituality, progression of understanding of how things work. We are behind many thousands of years. So I think things have been put in place and they've been timed for people to wake up now. It's quite clear there's a schism happening. Whereas, as you said before, there are other people that don't want to know this. They're, fair enough, they're over there. Yep. But the people who do are over there. But there's a big gap in the middle. And now that gap obviously provides people to, to go either way and join either group. But things are timed. And now, you know, when you start looking at the negativity of this current pandemic, start looking at it as also as a positive. Because something so great had to happen to shake humanity out of this hive mind. Otherwise, we'd have been in this hive mind forever. Nothing would have ever changed. We, now, when you look at it now, we have families who are now spending time together, of course, with social distancing. You have people working from home and now starting to realise that by working from home, I don't have to sit in traffic at nine o'clock every morning at five o'clock every night. There's less pollution. I can actually see the stars at night. There's less people. There's less things on the road, which is giving the earth a rest. Mm. <clears throat> now, when we go back to a normal, it will be a new normal. People are not going to be the same. There are several people in my street now who are, are, are growing vegetables in their gardens. They're starting to, to make allotments in their back gardens as a result of this 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 COVID-19, which, which I have my own opinions on, which is nothing to do with the virus. Yeah. But nevertheless, on the basis of this, people are now realising that they have to be self-sufficient.